I have to do um, legislative advocacy part two, advanced advocacy again next month as well, because there's just so much to, to get into. Um, so I see, I see a lot of faces. This is great people. Um, this is important to you. And I'm so grateful for that. Uh, we'll wait like one more minute since it's just 12 o'clock on the dot. Um, but what, you know, as we wait, I just wanted to say, um, you know, happy 2024. I haven't seen everybody since December and I hope everyone's holidays were, were peaceful and, um, healthy I know lots going on um, out there, but I also just wanted to to quickly mention. Um, I'm sure all of you have heard um, that over the holidays we we lost our incredible colleague uh, Carrie Mahoney, and um, I've kind of been starting most of my webinars now just uh, with a little uh, remembrance to her. Um, the loss is immeasurable for the arc and for this community, and. I just know that if she had a message to say to all of you, she would say, you know, don't give up the fight and don't be the family that sits in the back. Um, stand up, keep pushing the system. Um, I would say, say that she was one of those people that that said, you know, don't take no for an answer um, when it comes to your loved one, when it comes to your services and supports. Um, you know, just don't give up. So, so um, we're going to be doing something public for Carrie in February on the 22nd and, you know, I'd love people to join just so stay tuned for some information that will come out on that. But thanks for letting me share a little bit. Um, I think we have a good group here and I just also wanted, oh, I'll, I'll share my slides here to, so I'm get organized in some way. Hold on. Okay. One really good piece of news that I wanted to share. Can everyone see that okay? Um, is that we have an, a new colleague joining us in government affairs. Um, I'm really happy to introduce, if any of you haven't met him yet, Jose Lopez. Um, he's taking on the role of policy officer. Some of you might remember that role from Ellen Taverna. Um, she was wonderful and we're so happy and the timing couldn't be better um, to have Jose on board. Um, Jose, I don't know if you want to say a quick hello just so people see your face and, and know who you are. Here, I can start. Yeah, thank, thank you, Maura. No, just really happy to, uh, to join you know, all the efforts being done here. Um, and, and really, um, it's, it's a pleasure to be able to help others uh, and, and look forward to doing what I can. Jose, take a look at some of the names and faces here yep. today. <laughs> yep. These are going to be some of the folks that we work closely with um, that we're going to rely on for advocacy throughout this session. And um, hopefully you'll have a chance to get out and meet some people uh, where they work and where they're at um, and to engage with some of them at the State House as well. So look forward to it. Yeah, uh, we're we're real lucky to have you. Um, so okay, can people see this slide now? We're okay. All right. So let's jump in. Um, I always have to put our mission up here, but this is our group that knows the arc so well. So what I want to say on this slide is. If you haven't seen the save the date for our legislative reception this year with the MDDC, it is March 6th. It will be uh, blasted out there um, over the next month, but put it in your calendar now. Um, we This picture always like really inspires me because um, it makes an impact on our legislators. It makes an impact on our leaders when they walk into this room and they see the number of people here who uh, need services and supports. And um, let's try to get as many legislators as possible here this year. Uh, I would recommend that you reach out now as, you know, as early as it is to just say, please put this on your calendar. Please come by to hear the priorities um, for the ARC and um, you know, tell them uh, you promised them a photo op with you. Um, that'll get them there. 
Um, and then even, you know, some of you know this and have done this in the past, set up an appointment for after the legislative reception to go up to their office. Um, if it's with their the, the senator, senator or the rep, that's great. If not, let the staff, um, you know, take the time to meet with you. You'll have a one page ask that you can bring um, and, and talk about with them. So it's not too early to, to put it on their calendars. Um, things always happen and sometimes they can't make it, but they can almost always send staff and um, and they can usually find a way to at least stop by. So we really, really want to see the room full. And then if that date doesn't work for you and you want to attend the Autism Advocacy Day, that's going to be on April 9th this year. Um, some of you might remember we had the governor last year. We're, we're hoping to have the governor at one or both of these events next year as well. So just two things to keep in mind. It's a it's a action step we can all take to uh, today. Okay, so just some of the topics we're going to cover today. And again, just um, there's not too many people, but I can't see the chat. So just you know, yell out to me. You know, anytime you have a question or you want me to stop. Um, but we're going to cover a little bit on those FY twenty four. So this year, this current year's budget the nine C cuts that the governor made to, to that, a few of our DDS line items. Um, we'll go over those and what they really mean and how we can use them in our messaging now um, to really get through to the legislature. Um, then we're gonna talk about that messaging and about our legislative advocacy and what uh, the ARC is doing and what you can do, um, which is, um, I always share this piece in every, um, webinar, so you, many of you have heard it many, many times, but just the importance of sharing your story. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the FY25 uh, budget and some key timelines coming up for our priority bills. Um, so it's a lot to cover, but we'll get, we'll get going. Uh, again, another slide you've seen before, but I did want to just reinforce that right now we are super focused on budget and legislation. This is our time frame. Um, budget's going to be released on January 24th. Um, that'll be the governor's budget. And from, from that, we will know kind of where we're headed in the budget session, what our asks are going to be. And um, and then, as many of you know, where this is the you know the final stage of our bill session. So in early February, the bills will be um, voted on, and they um, have kind of a deadline of, of February seventh, I think, uh, as their joint Rule Ten deadline. Uh, the bills will come out, and then we have you know, a short, it's really a short time frame before the end of the session to get those bills prioritized, moved up the chain in, in ways and means and potentially designated um, to be voted on um, by the Senate and the House. So that's a lot. There's a lot to do in the next six months for sure. Um, I just put this up again to remind people that our advocacy works a uh, little inspo slide that we keep adding to. This is just the last 10 years, but there's so much more. I mean, so much more uh, progress we've made. I just like to highlight some of the ones that are, were important to me. And I like this slide because uh, Bill Canada and I look very young. Um, so I keep that one on there for me. Uh, all right, so let's get serious. The budget cuts. Um, you know, trying to put it in context, been really helpful to talk this through with Jose as a very uh, comprehensive uh, financial background for, for looking at budgets. So um, when we think about the governor's uh, budget, it's a $56 billion state budget. Um, she made $375 million in budget cuts. And she did this uh, midway through this year uh, because she needed to downgrade our tax revenue expectations by a by billion dollars. Um, so does that that overall uh, you know make sense to people? you know so so the cut was um, you know to many areas uh, due to the tax revenue. but for for DDS, we did get a a, a good 
hit we did we got 50 million out of that 375 million um cut to our services within dds and actually this 35 million from residential was the biggest chunk in one area that the governor cut so you know across all the services that she cut um residential was was for dds was her her biggest chunk um so when we think about $35 million being cut from residential, we have to remember that the full line item is $1.7 billion. Um, that's the residential line. That's the biggest line item for DDS. It's actually, I think, maybe a little more than half of the, yeah, so the total, total budget is $2.7 billion. So we are, you know, just about half of our DDS budget is residential. So that was the first cut. The next cut came in day and employment, which was uh, 13 million. Um, that line item totals, I think that what we ended up with last year was 243 um, million in that line item. And then another million from autism kids line item, the, the autism waiver. So the, those cuts come out of that $2.7 billion DDS budget, which uh, Jose was able to quickly uh, tell me 2%, a little less than 2% cut. Um, so I know this seems really like significant and it's, it's pretty upsetting that during a time where we have so many people unserved waiting for services and we, you know, are the the Boston Globe is highlighting that um, services within residential um, are are abysmal in some situations with neglect and very serious abuse. Um, so I think this is something for us to definitely react to. Um, the the messaging from DDS is that the money would have been reverted anyway. This was money that was unused due to the workforce crisis, due to the fact that we cannot get the vacancies in residential and in day and employment and in the homes for people who have kids with autism. We can't get those people those bodies in there so that we can actually bring people back and get the census up and um, make an impact on those vacancies. So to me, it feels very you know, circular. Um, if we don't fund the workforce, if we don't increase the rates and bring people in, we are going to be facing more cuts within our programs because of the vacancies within those programs. Does that make sense to people? Anybody have questions on that? I think it's kind of frustrating, <laughs> I would say. One question. Yes. Where would the money have been diverted to if the cuts hadn't been made? That's a very good question. The money would go back to the state. Although I think that's something that, you know, Leo and I need to talk to DDS about. Because if you guys remember, some of my, my advocates that are on here will remember that we had a line item in the budget last session. Actually, we've had it for in the budget for two sessions now um, that basically said that the, if money was not used um, in these line items, because we were forecasting these vacancies and, and this issue, um, that it could be transferable to other line items that may be able to use it. Now, the argument from DDS may be that no one else could use it because the workforce is throughout the workforces in transportation. We don't have anybody to pay there. We don't have anybody, you know, um, that that they can pay. But we say, you know, the, the number one line item, you know, that at least some of this money should revert to is family support. Um, and that's what, you know, we're hoping is still happening in some degree that these cuts are going back, but maybe there's other monies that is still getting transferred um, into family support, but but this is concernable, maybe not. So this is an area that we can really begin to pressure them on um, 
you know, we had an anecdotal story and I don't know if people were on uh, Leo's live on Monday, but just, you know, that a family had no access to day services, no day program, waiting on the day program and, and the uh, NDDS was able to give them $750. That's it. Um, so that's, that's not what we meant by transferable money, you know, um, so that's going to have to be part of our advocacy in a much clearer way and not just with the legislature, but, but with, with the, uh, commissioner and with DDS. Um, so, yeah, so, all right, so we'll, we'll move on, but those are the cuts and, um, these slides are really nice from our friends at ADDP. Um, the ARC's going to definitely- Question in chat. There's a question in chat, I think. Oh, sorry. I can't see the chat. Oh, yes, I can see the chat. Let me see. I think she's asking about- Provide training. Funds, can they also- What What about targeting pay increases for current workers? Right. So, sorry. I should have- I absolutely should have uh, made that clearer. So- Chapter 257 is the rate increase uh, line item that we need increased in order to raise rates for our DDS workers. These line items in, let me go back, in residential, um, it's not letting me go back for some reason, it's weird. Um, in residential and in, in day, they are unrelated to the rates. The rate setting is done separately than these line items. But your question about training, I believe that that, that is a really good question. Why aren't these funds being utilized um, to do additional training? It's it's sorely needed. I mean, the, the Globe article really highlighted that. Um, and honestly, some of you here are on our government affairs committee, and this is a big piece of what we've been talking about that um more neglect and abuse and other situ and then you know turnover of staff is happening because uh the training isn't um isn't enough there's not enough training so definitely another message that we need to carry so taking a look at these Slides is very, very helpful from ADDP. And I think um, this year the ARC is definitely going to try to do some more visuals because I think it's so helpful. Um, and I don't know if people know ALTR is, is basically residential. Not exactly even sure what ALTR stands for, if anyone knows. Um, yeah, more it's the um, it's the adult long-term residential. That's it. Great. LTR. Thank you, Jose. Yeah. So that that's what we're talking about for vacancies within residential. So 26% current, that was October of 20, 2023. Uh, that's the current um, information that we have. And this is based on a survey done by ADDP. Um, so it's not, you know, uh, it's not coming from DDS. It's, it's coming from the providers themselves. So with all these vacancies, um, this is what we're worried about. We're not we're going we're not going to be able to use the money that we fight hard for to get into these line items if we continue to see the vacancies. So overall, across all these areas, day hab, community um, based day programs, um, shared living, long term supports, AFC, and all the others, we're we're looking at a twenty four percent. Um, vacancy rate. And that, this one talks about the specific ALTR vacancy. Oh, no, this is by FTE, which is even more alarming, just looking at the direct support professionals. And this was actually in the Globe article too, you know, almost 4,000 vacancies. How are we functioning, you know, with- oh, there's, there's a second question. Um, it says- Not really a question, was this a, a statement? I, I just want to make- oh. Make sure I understand Please. something, because it sounds like DDS, if they're saying that they, the money would have already been reverted, but actually it shouldn't be because there are other uses for it. So I'm saying that the nine C cuts are still a loss that DDS needs to acknowledge. That is a loss. It's not, they can't just say, well, we would have reverted anyway because, well, no, there are other things we should have done with the money, which now we don't have because it's been cut. Right. I agree with you, 
Jesse, you know, we'll have to figure out exactly, you know, what amounts of money could have been transferable. Um, but that, you know, that is the argument. Why are we fighting and advocating for funds to be transferable um, if if you're just going to revert them at the end of the year or mid-year anyway? That's one point. And then the other point is, you know, this is just a glaring message that the funds are getting reverted because we don't have workforce. Um, and why isn't that keying people in on raising the rates um, as at least, you know, a, the foundational way to to make an impact, right? Because we know there's a lot of other things we need to do. There's many, many other things we need to do to increase the workforce in um, Massachusetts. But yeah, so so I think there's there's a way that we you know, need to talk about these cuts um, that brings it back to the workforce, right? I think it also um, uh, helps us prepare going forward in the future, maybe not for this um, budget, but maybe future ones, as to what things can we identify that where funds can be reverted or sent to, uh, transitioned to, uh, and give a, a very detailed kind of funding forecast. I think that that would be some, so we're, we're learning the whole time as well, right? And even, even though um, uh, this is a very difficult situation that that while it's improving, it's improving at a very slow rate, I think there are things we, we can prepare ourselves to be better um, serving some some of the, these changes as we go forward. Uh, so it's still a, a lot to figure out for sure. Absolutely. No, I agree. We need to get more detailed around what that money should be going to and um I don't know, I just did this slide because all of these words are just sort of floating around, um, but they're important messages. They really are. Um, you know, when we're when we're talking to our legislators, when you're talking to your neighbors, um, you know, just being able to understand just how unrelenting this workforce crisis has been. Um, you know, to 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 end up on the front page of the globe is pretty significant. And this is our second spotlight article. Um, and we also had a really great article by Jason Laughlin on, you know, those who are still waiting um, to be served. Uh, so the media is is picking up finally, which is great. Um, so I don't know, other people have words they could throw in here that they're feeling, that they're seeing, they're experiencing, uh, let me know. It's pretty dismal. But what uh, to, to Jose's point, sorry, this screen is a little weird. Um, what we can also talk about is the progress that we are seeing, the slow progress, right? And that also can make an impact because they always want to be, you know, our lawmakers want to know that the money that they decide to put into something is working. You know, it's actually having an impact. And it's it's clear that the places that we um, are seeing decreased vacancy, so more staff, are those places that got an increase, right? Day programs got an increase. We had the 200 million put into uh, mass health day programs. We had an increase for CBDS last year. And what do we see? We see a little bit of progress in staff coming back to those programs. We did not have an increase in residential. We don't see any, uh, we don't see improvement in the vacancies. So I feel like that's another way to kind of come at it, that yes, it, and it may take time, but as we increase the rates, people are going to, and, and of course, we're hearing that from providers. You know, I I, um, I hear from a provider that I'm close to that they used to have onboarding every month and it would be like two or three staff and they're a big organization. And now they got a full room. So, so those are good signs. Those are good signs that the money that we fought for last year is actually working. But guess what? The cost of living continues to rise. Um, housing is still a huge issue. So a lot of things that we need this rate to continue to rise. 
for. Um, I thought maybe after all that messaging and all that information, we could just talk a little bit about like kind of the three simple points that we might want to share. Um, thousands are waiting. We have we know that from ADDP's survey. We know that from the data um, that is being released um, from the state as well. Thousands are waiting for services. Uh, the Globe's re reports are um, very clear that we need better oversight, more staffing, um, more clinical supports. I mean, the list goes on. Um, and, and that autism specifically is a growing problem um, as so many um, folks are becoming adults who who were diagnosed with autism during that period of boom. And, you know, the rates continue to rise. So we need to be more prepared um, in our group homes and residences. And then finally, you know, the governor's cuts to DDS, although um, were, were set to be reverted, um, we know the reason for that. And the reason isn't because we can't, you know, we couldn't use them. We could use them if we just had a workforce there. Um, so that circular issue. So do those points hit home? So what are we doing about it now? Um, so we're working with the Globe. We've been working with the Globe on, on those two articles since last summer, actually. Um, and, you know, trying to persuade in some ways and, uh, to, to really focus on the workforce and, and, and that issue. Um, and we have some other media that's definitely important. I mean, I just feel like media is key right now. Um, and then uh, we just, uh, Jose and I actually just sent a letter to the governor um, from Leo and um, it went to uh, the governor, the uh, secretary, um, the commissioner of DDS, a couple other high level leaders. Um, basically outlining these concerns. However, the, the letter did go out before the budget cuts. And so um, we'll, we'll probably be readdressing those um, as well um, or incorporating them uh, um, as really another issue uh, around the workforce. So um, continuing to make workforce rates and the unserved our top priority as we move into FY25. Um, we're planning to have a public briefing um, right after the budget is released. Hopefully we'll get some media there as well. Um, you know, hopefully it will be some good news <laughs> to talk about, but given our revenue situation, we'll be prepared otherwise. Um, and then engaging the legislature, which is really where we need, need your voices. I mean, there's much more that we're doing, but those are some of the highlights. Um, and what can what can you do? Uh, well, so one thing we can all do, um, and we're gonna have this ready to go by Friday, is a letter to the governor. Um, some of you have done this before with us. It's a little different than our action alerts um, because letters to the governor have to go through a certain form um, on the website. Uh, but we're going to work that out. We're going to have the template ready. And uh, basically, it's going to be short and sweet, kind of covering those those messages that I just had up on the slide. Um, we've made an impact when we've reached out to the governor in the past. I don't know if people remember. Um, I think one of the last times we reached out to the governor was around um, the workers um, during COVID, um, the frontline workers getting the, the increases that other healthcare providers got during COVID. And we sent 25,000 letters to the governor and it was huge. It was fantastic. Um, and we got the increase. They, they were able to get those increases, um, to home and community-based workers. So, but, um, <clears throat> 
So that letter will be ready and we'll give you super easy um, instructions on how to um, personalize the letter as well. But all of you can also do letters to the editor. I know I've seen a couple already from some of our advocates in the community that were really powerful responses to the front page story, but they don't have to be a response. You can just you know, be writing letters to the editor around um, the current situation um, and, and your personal connection even. Uh, other ways I think you all know, but this is the time to strengthen your connection with your rep and senator um, to really stay consistent with that. You're probably, when I say that, I, I'm also referring to their staff. Um, if you don't know the legislative director's name, or the chief of staff's name in your rep and senator's office, um, find that out to call them and find that out today because that's an important thing for you to know um, and to stay connected to that person as things get really busy this session. And then if you can think about bringing more voices um, within your district to your community. Try, try to come together because that's going to be really powerful. Um, one of the things Jose was able to do is, is look at our action alert system data, which is um, really amazing. And, you know, I, I had to stop and say, you know, how grateful I am for all the people who, who engage in this. I mean, um, I think it's a really powerful tool when we follow up on those letters. When you send a letter and you follow up, I think it's a really powerful tool. Um, a lot of people seem to sign up for the action alerts, but aren't actually sending out the alert. So we really want to we really want to push that this year. Um, and then sharing your story um, or the stories of those that you support. I think everyone knows and agrees that that is, um, that's what sticks with people, right? Um, and these are slides I won't take much time on because we've gone through them before. Um, it's just really advocacy is really multi-pronged, right? There's just so much that needs to come at the governor and the legislature to affect change. Um, and I know you guys probably have other strategies as well. Um, but the stories, which we've been over before, they are the way that we clarify, you know, they're the way that we connect. Um, and if you haven't, if you didn't come to my webinar last month, um, or my storytelling webinar, I'm going to, I'm going to share this slide one more time, just cause I just love it. Um, uh, this wonderful researcher, Yuri Hansen, um, did some research on storytelling and actually did brain to brain MRIs. What, what he found was when he put people in an MRI um, and had them talk to each other and he monitored this functional MRI, um, he could see the brain lighting up when storytelling was happening versus the brain not lighting up at all um, when regular conversation was happening. Um, he called it brain to brain coupling. Um, and he said, evolutionarily, we are programmed to learn from each other through storytelling. It causes us to have better concentration and better memory. And that one story stays with people more than you know, 10 million pieces of, of data. So I agree, this is what we're all about. This is what, you know, we need data, we need stories, but just know the story is what's gonna sit with people and it's what they're gonna remember. I forget data all the time. So I always have to have that part written down. Or, uh, there's a, there's yeah. a question in the chat to say, um, <clears throat> can you share a copy of your letter to governor, HHS and DDS? Um, yes, um, we, will, we will make that letter public. Um, I think what we're going to focus on for the next 24 hours is getting the template ready for the community, but the letter that's going to be available to the community to send will very much be a condensed form of the letter that Leo and, and Jose and I sent to the governor. Um, we did get a little more, you know, into the weeds. And I think coming from the community, we want to keep it simple and, and really powerful and direct. Um, but we'll share both for sure. And um, yeah, so stay tuned.
Thanks for letting me know what's in there. Uh, and, and you've all seen this, but uh, just another um, reminder. Those are just all reminders that all the work that you're doing with your rep and senator, um, it's so that they can influence these four individuals. Um, and if you're lucky enough that, you know, Senator Spilka is your senator, then you're, you're you know, you're a step ahead. Um, but we really need your reps and senators to bring this issue to them as, as a super high priority. We, um, we have some bills that are stuck in committee right now with, uh, you know, chairs of the committee making decisions around the bill that we really are going to need to Im influence and impact. So um, stay tuned in the next couple of weeks. There's going to be a lot of action happening with action alerts and requests for you to uh, connect, you know, with your with your legislators. Especially, well, you know, the budget will be released, so we'll have uh, something to really set up our advocacy around after the 24th. This will be Jose's first budget session, and I'm very excited to have his help. Um, but, you know, you guys know the drill here, and this this page on the um, on the masslegislature.gov website is so very helpful. Uh, I see that this is an old slide because it says 192nd General Court, which we are not in anymore. Um, but th this gives you a nice timeline, right? The governor's budget gets released. You know, we will most definitely have some issues that we are going to want the House and Senate to weigh in on and, and uh, increase. Typically, over the last couple of years, we've had money asks, funding asks, and we've also even been able to get some uh, policy done in the budget. This has been, you know, actually kind of the way we've gotten some of our bills passed the last couple of years. Um, so the budget process is super important to both funding and to policy, even though probably everyone will tell you no policy should get done in the budget. We know it does just does. So any questions on the timeline here? I know it's not like the easiest si slide to read, but um, I really like, you know, the way masslegislature.gov sets this up. So just going in here and checking it frequently, it gives you the information you need um, to understand the process. Any questions though on, you know, how the budget process or anything coming up? Oh, there's, is there another chat? I will definitely oh, share yeah, the says, link. Yeah. Can you share the link to today's update and, and the slides so we can share with our networks? Yes, we're going to share that. That'll, that's easy. We can do that right after. And then um, and then stay, you know, stay tuned for more. We're almost to the end, you guys. <laughs> uh, all right, so we already talked a little bit about this. So the budget's coming. And a week later, we're at that, you know, deadline of our bills needing to be voted on. Um, so right now, actually, is the time where committees are coming together. They're uh, considering votes on our bills. A lot of the research and deep dive into the bills has already been done. Um, some of you have been involved in, you know, meeting with committee staff. Um, the ARC has been meeting with committee staff now since, you know, really since the beginning of the hearing sessions to kind of go over language changes and um, questions. So probably no extensions this year, but, you know, you never know. Sometimes bills will get ex extensions for one reason or another. Um, but if they don't get voted on, um, most likely the bill will need to be refiled next session if um, if we decide that that's the route. Um, the good, the, the, the news that would be good would be to see our bills moving into ways and means or third reading. Um, but we also know that, you know, these committees get swamped with bills. Um, so how do we get our bills to rise up and be the ones that eventually end up getting voted on um, closer. It's usually closer to the end of the session, but you know, bills will pop up here and there. And as an example, um, 
most of you saw last week, I think that um, the Senate passed two of the ARC's priority bills, the blue envelope, um, which some of you worked on very hard. Um, Marie, thank you so much. I mean, talk about media, the, the media story that Marie Zulo's family uh, was involved in just had so much play. Um, and it really, it pushed people from all over the state to make calls which was phenomenal. And I got a ton of them because everybody thought the bill passed <laughs> and they they wanted the blue envelope. And I was like, it hasn't passed yet. Um, but, you know, the, that was a big step that, they, that the Senate voted and passed that bill and the wheelchair access bill. Um, so the next step, you know, for those bills is that they'll move, the, they are in House Ways and Means now and the House has to prioritize um, when and if they will take those bills up for a vote. So some extra work needs to be done now on the House side on those bills. So any questions on joint rule or the bills that are in committee? I know people have bills that are really important to them and they're probably worried about whether or not, you know, what their fate is. Okay. If you have questions on any bill that you're worried about or you really want to do some extra work on, please just reach out to myself or Jose um, by email and, you know, we can help you strategize on best ways. There's another comment, Maura. Um, it says, <clears throat> can you reiterate your comments around the budget cuts and the workforce? Oh, there you go. Um, Challenge is a circular issue. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think what I'm trying to say is that these monies that the governor cut, the $50 million, chunk of it in residential, chunk in community day, um, uh, were going to be reverted back to the state because they were unutilized. And the reason they weren't utilized is because of the vacancies in these programs, the staff vacancies do not allow us to bring folks back to full services and supports. So um, to me, that's a circular issue because if we could be funding the workforce and bringing them up to um, a rate, a, 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 a wage that is fair and allows them to, you know, to live here in Massachusetts, um, then we, we could staff these programs and bring people back to services so that's what i mean about circular like um if we don't do anything about the workforce we're just going to keep seeing certain vacancies and and have less and less people be able to go back and then one way we kind of proved that was we saw workforce increases happen in the day programs and and what we saw was a minimal increase in um census in in in, in uh, decrease in vacancies so i know the words are challenging so increase and decrease and but does that does that make sense to whoever had that question and thank you for that question yeah i was just wondering you had made a really poignant statement earlier you had started off with like if we don't fund the workforce you were talking about this issue being very circular we don't fund the workforce, then you had like three statements in a row and it was just very, it was perfect soundbite. Okay. I did have three like <laughs> statements that, that I put up that I'll, put, I'll throw those back up. Um, on the slide. Just because I think, um, you know, it'll be part of our um, ask, our letter to the governor as well. Mm -hmm. um, just so that we can be super clear. Was it this one? There's thousands waiting. Well, maybe, well, maybe it wasn't this one, but but these are three really good points. You know, we have thousands waiting for services. We know that the services uh, are are needing more. We need more training. We need more supports for for workers, and um, we need to make sure that we're hiring good people and um, people who can manage really complex individuals that the training is is enough. And then um, these cuts are, are due to this workforce crisis. So I guess maybe 
maybe that was partially what you were talking about, just these three points that really need to hit home. Um, but I probably said something else somewhere else. Along. It was something brilliant, but I'll, <laughs> I'll listen back to the recording. Okay. I couldn't write fast enough. No, that's okay. I think we'll probably have some really good um, messaging in that letter. And then stay tuned because we're, you know, this is the messages we're going to carry. We talked about training, um, reverting funds, trans transferable funds. All of these things need to follow in our advocacy for the session. Um, but you all have great knowledge um, from your personal experiences, from your professional experiences, and we absolutely need to hear it. Um, we are so lucky to have a really strong community um, of advocates, and we hear um, a lot from our steering committee and from government affairs, and I hear a lot from all of you individually. But anytime you know, you're facing something or you have an idea, please share it with us. Um, you know, this is it, the lived experience, whether it's professional or personal is where all of this, um, all the ideas come from. I really appreciate everybody's time, but, but mm -hmm. other questions? Okay, so stay tuned. The next day or two, you'll see some stuff coming out. And then the next weeks, we'll be busy with the budget and the bills. Um, and I don't know, Jose, do you want to put your email in the uh, chat? And that way people can reach you also. I think everybody knows Charlie. Um, but we'll, we are the team for sure to reach out to. Charlie, I think this is the first time I've seen you. Um, on the Zoom. So I finally get to put your face to your name. It's a pleasure to see you. Oh, that's great. All right, everybody. So yes, we will send out the recording, even though I am kind of bumbling all over the place, but we'll send that out and we'll send the slides and then stay tuned and spread the word. Um, so we get, you know, thousands of letters generated to the governor. All right. Thanks, everybody. Oh, and, and uh, Jose just got his email in there, too. So thanks, everybody. Take care and stay well. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. Later.